Um, <clears throat> I brought up Microsoft's developer documentation. Um, while I'm analyzing this, I'm looking at malware that's running on Windows, it's going to be calling Windows functions. Um, so it'll be handy to have a reference manual available. That's why I have that here. Um, also, perfectly fine is to actually have the, um, they have some really nice printed copies of it that are really thick books that you can get. Uh, so you can get the Microsoft Windows uh, quick reference as well if you're ever analyzing stuff there. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to walk through um, and successfully try and uh, launch the exploit and analyze it this time. Uh, as we're walking through, I'll point out uh, some of the techniques that are being employed that link back to the slides that I uh, presented off of um, a few classes ago. Um, so this example is really nice because it actually employs like almost like at least one example of every single one of those techniques that I talked about. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so we'll just go ahead and kick it off. Um, so I have my vanilla virtual machine. Um, again, one of the reasons I'm using Windows XP um, is that uh, it just happens to be easier from like a demonstration perspective to show you all the different tricks that are happening here. Um, uh, as you saw earlier, the success rates are not always 100% for these. Um, the memory state of the program changing slightly can have um, dramatic uh, impact on the uh, success or failure of the exploit. Um, so as uh, you move up from IE6, or I should say, sorry, Windows XP and Internet Explorer 6, but mainly Windows XP up through Windows 7, Windows 8, 8.1, and 10, uh, Microsoft adds a number of different features. There's supposed to be security measures in the Windows to try and combat stuff like this from working very successfully. So then they end up running into a situation where uh, I will spend more of the class fighting with the operating system um, to try and get whatever it is to launch properly. From your perspective, malware analysis, um, <coughs> whether it's 64-bit or 32-bit, for the most part, um, most of the software that you will be dealing with uh, is probably going to be designed to be backward compatible, at least uh, to be able to run, all the way back to Windows XP or Windows 7. Um, so, from your perspective, uh, analysis, the goal of analysis being to get the information out of the malware to figure out what it's doing, where it's going, that type of stuff, uh, generally you want to get to that as quickly as possible. So, working off of an older VM that ha would have a less secure posture and be more likely to be exploitable is to your benefit. So, generally what I try and do is work from the earliest version of Windows I can find that seems to work with that exploit that seems to successfully launch it. So that's part of the reason I'm working with Windows XP now. Uh, the information I won't get is whether Windows 10 stops this exploit or not. Um, so I wouldn't learn that even by running it under Windows 10, for instance. There's a completely different um, technique that's uh, like software system validation, stuff like that that could tell you. Uh, they could tell you that stuff. Um, which probably lines up more with like your vulnerability assessment class. So that said, um, I have the folder mounted, so I'm going to go to the shared space again. And I'm going to pull that example back out. There we go. So I'm going to pull that example back out on my desktop. Um, I always try and launch it from the desktop, um, mainly because uh, that way it doesn't try and delete itself. Um, a lot of times what these will try and do is they'll try and delete the original file. I don't want it to delete itself out of my shared folder. Um, and also, a lot of them are expecting to be executed from the local hard drive. Uh, so I'll try and just recreate the environment it's expecting to get. So I'm going to log or load up Immunity Debugger again. And... We'll go through the same series of steps that I started, or that I did like halfway through the last class. Just go through um, here to load up the program that we're actually going to analyze, which is Acrobat Reader, because we're going to break Acrobat Reader. So it loads up again. 
It sets up the initial state. And this is where uh, the failure occurred last time was I was walking through all of this uh, and I was trying to demonstrate some of the different functions within community debugger. And I went and paused and ran uh, the Acrobat reader a number of times. Uh, at some point, when I was talking through it, I ended up re uh, hitting the rewind button after it had already messed with the memory state a bunch. Um, this ended up just restoring back to um, the beginning of the loading of the software, but it actually left some changed memory state in place that I guess negatively impacted the exploit. So we're not going to do that this time. Uh, we're just going to run it as if I just run Acrobat. So I'm going to kick it off. And I actually have some notes here too. So another thing that I'll say is handy is to have like a notebook or something like that where you can kind of write down notes as you're walking through. There's one thing that you might have noticed that I did have to run through before um, and I might have to do it once more during this class is uh, a lot of times you'll walk through uh, analysis of the exploit or of the attack uh, and uh, you'll get to a certain point where uh, you end up um, causing the program to quit or causing the exploit to fail or something like that. And in the event that you do that, you end up wanting to revert back to the original vanilla image. So keeping notes is very helpful because you have to replay your steps over and over again to get it right. So desktop. So I'm gonna load it again. It's trying to load it, trying to load it, trying to load it, and it crashed. And it crashed at this memory location here. So this BD uh, to VE4. Um, so uh, this, if I go over to the memory window, I can actually see where that is. And that ends up being in here somewhere. So inside of this code somewhere. Uh, which is part of the Acker read. It says Acker read run one process. I don't exactly know what the Acker read one means, but maybe it's just like forks off a sub process. So well, yeah, some sort of internal detail about the program. So I'm going to go back over to the CPU window now. Which I think maybe is this one. Yeah. So C for CPU. I can go to that. And then I'm going to do the same thing I was doing before, which is I want to do a breadth first tra traversal of, um, or sorry, depth first traversal of uh, all of the um, events that are going to happen after this, uh, after this exception is passed back to the application. So it caused an exception. In a normal running situation, that exception would be handed off to the application. So the application could uh, kick off any of the um, crash report functionality that you normally see in a lot of applications, right? Um, typically, it doesn't end up being something built into Windows uh, for a lot of enterprise applications. It's actually something that's particular to each one. So um, they're relying upon that taking over in order for this exploit to work. So I'm going to go through. And so as you recall, when I was going through these before, it makes a number of um, embedded calls, so calls within calls that go into the Windows uh, API, a number of different levels. Um, at one point, when we're walking through this, we end up running into a situation where um, it ends up getting caught in a really long loop. So, and what I'm trying to keep an eye out here for is each one of these different, they're highlighted red because they're really, it makes it very useful for me to pick them out. But I'm trying to look for ones that might call into or have a destination that's like a variable or something. Um, I'll also keep my eye out for anything, any occasions where it looks like the program is caught in a really long uh, kind of cyclical loop um, where it's basically constantly jumping back on itself like this. Um, and the reason I'm going to keep an eye on this is that if I step through here and I try and look at what the uh, comparison is here, let me, I don't know why this line ends up being minimized, but it does. 
Um, it wants to compare these two things. So it's comparing some arbitrary value. Um, and I just forgot that I also wanted to change the appearance so that everyone can actually see what I'm doing. Uh, so let me do that really quick. And go back up here to this one, to this one, to one better. There we go. So that should be readable to everyone. Uh, let me expand this up a little bit. Uh, so what it's doing is if we look at this comparison right here, it wants to jump if um, it wants to jump back up here. Back up here to the AAD8, which is AAD8. So it wants to jump back up here if uh, one of these, if uh, this one is less than this one. And it looks like it's frequently less than that one. Um, so so basically I'm stuck in this situation where it's uh, walking through um, a bunch of different, what it looks like are possibly function calls or something like that. And that's what you're seeing right here is it's uh, enumerating a number of different function entry points. Uh, so that's going to take a while to try and go through, but after it's done with the loop, I know that it's going to end up at this line. I'm just looking at the structure between these two. So between uh, this line right here, which one is it again? A, D, 8. So, or, yeah. it's going to basically return control back to this function in some way. Eventually, it's going to end up down here. Um, I will say that I spent a large amount of time analyzing this code path here. Um, and I'm not going to analyze this particular one in class because I have determined this one's not exactly relevant and it could take easily an hour on its own just to go through all the different pieces of this and talk about that. Um, so what I'm going to end up using is this um, button which ends up basically running until exit and what it'll do is it will, um, this F7 that I keep hitting, basically it'll cause the, uh, the debugger to do that for me and wait until it runs into a return instruction. Uh, so I've validated that um, none of this stuff in here is pertinent to be kind of showing uh, the exploit doing its job. So I'm actually just going to run to the end of that function. And then I'm going to get out of it. And what ends up happening is <coughs> I'm going to single step until I look for an attempt to call a function that's provided by variable or call a function that's provided by register. Um, and in, it, in this particular case, that's uh, the piece of code that is um, enabling uh, attacker data to actually be incorporated uh, into, into the uh, control flow. So I'll keep walking through until I find something like that. And as you can see, there's a lot of these little tiny functions that are just doing very small things. And you'll see there's a lot of that. When you analyze your own programs uh, that you've written, you'll find out that that occurs uh, quite frequently. Um, like the memory move uh, function is a really good example. But this right here is what I'm talking about where it's call by variable instead of a, or what I would call an indirect call versus this one, which is a direct call. So this one, actually has an address and you can see it over here. So I'm going to extend out the bytes a little bit so you can see them. This one has a uh, address. It's a relative address, but it has an address embedded within it. Um, this one down here does not. This one actually is dependent on whatever the value of ECX is at the time. So I'm going to keep stepping through here and um, what you'll notice is that leading up to this it starts pushing a whole bunch of values onto the stack. So, and if I remember correctly, um, this 
work is occurring because it's trying to provide a number of uh, data points that the exception handler that the application provides or that the environment provides um, will use or will be able to use in order to report crash information back. Uh, so for instance, it's um, pushing this information. You can already see some of it here. You keep going down. So see, push this right here. Um, so I'm going to just kind of go down here. Pushes the value um, right here. FS as well, um, which itself is a selector that in the architecture that has a special meaning in Windows, um, puts a value into, or, or takes the stack pointer and puts it into uh, into that um, into that destination, and then it ends up pushing, and that there's an uh, important thing to note too is that this right here is the stack pointer so 12 CEB0 all these values that they're actually pushing on here and you'll see that this is another one 12 CF56 so all of these values that got pushed on here are actually a number of addresses that are within the range of the program step right here. So if you remember the memory map, um, here we go. the memory map window shows you um, what each one of the memory ranges is allocated to. So this is your whole, it's supposed to be in this case your whole 32-bit memory range. Uh, so it shows you what all those things are allocated to. Um, a whole bunch of addresses that are referring to things that are on the stack actually just got pushed on there. And then, if I go back here, the next thing that's going to happen is DCX is going to be making a jump. So it actually wants to call code that is located at this address, which is 280B0B. So that's also another important number to keep uh, to keep in mind. Um, I've kind of got it up here, so I'll uh, make sure I point it out because you'll see it again in the future. Um, but I'm going to jump back to the memory just so you can also see. That's likely right here. And one of the interesting things about this is that it wants to call, it wants to send the processor to start executing code that's located here. And here ends up being this unicode.nls, which is basically a, um, a natural language um, lookup table system. So it's supposed to be for um, it's supposed to be a lookup table that's supposed to be able to provide you like locale specific error messages and stuff like that. So in addition to the character set differences between locales, of course you're all probably familiar that the wording and the sentences also have to be different too. So they maintain that in a series of tables. So for some reason, these are loaded at this location, and it's trying to send the processor to it. And it's also been mapped into Windows as readable. So um, that's particularly interesting. I'm going to open this up really quick before I actually try and show you what the processor is going to do when it's presented with this. So it's 28ODOD, I think, or OBOD. I can't remember. Zero B, zero B. So this ends up being 28 OB. So this would be 8, 9, A, B. So there's a, there's a handful of bytes there. And it looks to me like this is basically like a set of pointers in a table. Well, the interesting thing about that is that, and this is where the debugger also comes in really handy, is I don't even have to extract this data to go and analyze it 
as if it were in the CPU, I can actually just right click on it and click disassemble. And sometimes it doesn't get the alignment just right, but I can see that the byte that I had highlighted is now highlighted here. And so what's really interesting about this is that <clears throat> it tells it basically this sequence of bytes encodes a uh, request or encodes instructions to call the pointer located at some location on the stack. So a normal working case and uh, I'd say in a more modern processor, um, this approach uh, doesn't work very well. If you recall, um, and this is a really good example of why one of those mitigations that I talked about in that lecture was implemented. Um, uh, there was the write, um, write and not execute um, uh, mitigation in there, and also just in general, the like per page execute um, uh, attribute um, on memory ranges that should set it up so that none of these can be executed. But uh, what you're seeing here is that when these pages were mapped into Windows, these permissions were asked, um, but on this version of Windows, and in this architecture, um, those restrictions are really protected by a software mechanism and not necessarily by a hardware mechanism. So if the processor were to be told to enter them through normal means, there'd be a number of software checks in place that would go and look up this map to figure out if it's actually supposed to be going there or not. But since we've managed to figure out a way to get an address into the processor, um, without having it go through the software checks. It allows it to just continue ahead uh, without, um, you know, without being executed or without being tested as to whether the memory range was intended to be for execution. So in a nutshell, what happened is the adversary sat here and messed with Acrobat Reader for a while and tried to figure out how they could basically where a set of bytes existed in memory, in data memory or whatever, uh, that actually just happened to encode a, a small instruction that they wanted to um, that they wanted to fire off. And that one's what this is jumping to basically. So what happens is it jumps to that and then that tells the processor to call or jump to another location in memory. So what happens is after it gets through this exception handler and out of the Windows code that's in this library, it makes a jump, and then it makes another jump. And uh, we'll show you uh, how it gets to their jump here now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to step into it so I can see what's going on. And so what you can see is that I'm now sitting at that instruction that I was showing you over here. And the processor, like the debugger, didn't even catch any exception from that. So you can see the debugger thinks this is okay even. So, <clears throat> so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to step into that, but first I want to go and look at what's here. So um, <clears throat> what's important to look at is that uh, the current location of the stack is the same as it was when we left the last um, call with the exception of uh, uh, the most recent instruction on the stack is actually the address of the code that it was just at that we were looking at. But everything above that is still the same. So all those um, pointers to data within the system stack or within the program stack uh, that were pushed onto um, that were pushed onto the stack before we made that call, uh, before we tried to transfer to the uh, custom exception handler, um, <clears throat> all that stuff is still here. Uh, and al also, I can go back to the memory window, and I can actually look at the stack. And I'm going to change the view of this to one that shows me more data at once. So I'm going to use a wider view. Um, so this shows all of that. And now let me go back here to the CPU to show you. Um, so current stack is right here, C9 or CE9C, so 12 CE9C. Uh, where it wants me to jump is memory that is 30 bytes ahead of that. So the address of what it wants me to jump to is stored 30 bytes ahead of that. And there's another address, and that address happens to be 
12F574, which is some address that's even further down. So we can actually go through here and we can look at that. Whoops, sorry. Uh, I'm going to go up here and the, not that one. This one. Whoops. There it is. That's the one I'm looking at. So let me pull this over here so that I can keep track of it easier. Um, so here we go. Now I can see down here. So we'll just go 12C, so 12C, 9C, if I remember correctly. So I'm going to go jump, jump down here. And if I really want to, I can do a go to address and I can just do 0012C, 9C. I think it's 00-12-C-9-C. Oh, 12 what am I doing wrong? 12-C-E-9-C. Excuse me. Oh, 12 c e 9 c There. And that put it basically up here at the top. Um, so that's the current address of stack memory. Um, where it wants me to go is actually down here or I should say that's where the address is. And what you will notice is that a whole bunch of, remember these are stored, um, these are all stored what would be readably backwards to, to all of us, um, stored in little Endian mode. But you can see that this entire section here, they managed to get a whole bunch of these stack addresses on there. Um, none, you know, that was by design. That's how they set up the, uh, exploit so when they found a way um, that they could get the um, program into an exploitable state then they messed with um, the operations that they could perform until they managed to get enough of these on there so that they could guarantee for the most part that there is a um, that this instruction would be referencing something that does exist and does point to what they want it to so we'll go and look at that which is 12 f574 so I'll just go to that. So 0012 F574. <clears throat> and so what happens when I see that, uh, which is this is the destination where it wants to go, and it does a good job of evaluating what that is. That's this address is where it wants to send the processor next. And this happens to be um, so number one, this happens to be data that's located on the stack. So this is trying to execute code that was managed to be put on the stack. And the stack is where your program is dumping all of the dynamic data that it's allocating and freeing and allocating and freeing as it calls it a new functions and loads other functions and messes with data structures and does all sort and passes arguments and everything. Another thing worth uh, picking up from here too is that within this memory block, you can see that there's a really long like repeating pattern here. Uh, one of the interesting things about this pattern is that right here is 00280B0B. That happens to be that address that I pointed out earlier that was where we had managed to do that call ECX. We managed to convince that call ECX to jump to. Um, so whatever mechanism was used was very similar to that heap spray um, mechanism that I talked to you about earlier, which um, basically attempts to, or in this in this case might be a, <clears throat> a stack overflow type of thing, or a, um, <clears throat> the term for this escapes me, but um, anyway, um, it's very similar to that where they're trying to uh, basically spray a repeating sequence of that data all over the place um, in hopes that they manage to get at least one of these copies of it to show up in the right place. And they managed to successfully get that to happen in this case, and that's why uh, it ended up being put into ECX when we were going through that, um, uh, that code that was part of the Windows system libraries. It was actually code inside of NTDLL. The other thing, which is this EB06, EB06, so that's actually, uh, there's actually, uh, two copies of the same two-byte instruction. 
So basically they wanted to make sure that that instruction got put into memory and also this address got put into memory um, all over the place, possibly because uh, this exploit is not very deterministic. So um, it's almost like the luck of the draw as to which one of these you're going to land on when you finally recover out of the exception chain. So like I was showing in the last class, when I was unable to successfully get this thing to get to this point, um, there's a lot of variables that go on in the background. Um, making repetitions like this allows the attacker to create an exploit that has a higher chance of succeeding even if the memory ranges end up being shifted kind of up by 100 bytes or down by 100 bytes or something like that. Because you are dealing with systems that have a huge amount of other randomness going on in the background or at least non-deterministic non behavior going on in the background. Um, <clears throat> And so that's kind of the reason for this. So this is a demonstration of like why that uh, heap spray technique that I mentioned earlier is extremely valuable. Uh, for the, from the attacker's perspective, it helps them increase the likelihood of success. Uh, so um, I'm not going to disassemble this, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to follow it because this will... Um, so the nice thing about the CPU window here is that this ends up doing the same thing as me disassembling that code except this ends up following it, whereas the other one does not. So I'm going to step into that. And now, again, I didn't get any sort of like access exception or anything like that in the debugger. So the debugger, the processor, Windows all think this is fine. What's going on? Even though we're sitting on the stack and now executing code. Um, you can also see now <coughs> what that instruction is decoding to. And it's decoding to a, basically a jump to somewhere six bytes ahead of the current position. So uh, if you were to calculate this up, this right here is the four bytes that represent that address. And then there's these two bytes here that are the next copy of this two byte instruction. So what it ends up doing is it creates this, um, it creates this chain or the sequence of breadcrumbs or almost a, uh, what I would say almost a no op sled like I was talking about before, but one of the benefits to this particular implementation is that um, <clears throat> it succeeds in providing that kind of heap spray capability, that uh, ability to, um, if you can't guarantee that that return to address is in the right place, or I should say if you can't guarantee that you're always going to get that in the right place with one execution of the exploit operation, they end up running the exploit operation multiple times. Um, to try and get that um, data all over memory in hopes that at least one of them is likely to end up in what I would say is the right place to succeed the exploit. Um, <clears throat> and then these jumps basically will do this. I'll show you like what happens is exactly literally what it says here is it's just going to jump six bytes ahead and then it's going to land on another jump which is going to jump six bytes ahead. So it's basically going to leapfrog like this all the way down. And as you recall, there were a huge amount of these repetitions, right? Um, one thing that's also noteworthy, um, I couldn't comment on why it's built this way, but it is, is that it just randomly has these no ops in here as well. So this might be an artifact of um, when the person who built it, um, they might have stitched together two different um, pieces of code and for whatever reason, um, it bridged them with these uh, no ops. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, who knows, or it might be there to try and confuse people, or there might be some functional reason, like the exploit might not succeed if they're not there. Um, again, um, unwinding that, explaining why that's the case, um, could be like a couple of classes on its own, and I'm not going to dive into it, um, but, you know, this is a good example of the type of thing that you could run into. Uh, so we, as you can see, it does four of those, and then it just picks up uh, with this again. So one of the interesting things about that is that that actually offsets this um, by two bytes, or it, uh, or in other words, it shifts the ordering. So if you were to look at this as being the address followed by two copies of the jump instruction, they shift the ordering to basically be two copies of the jump instruction on eight and A or whatever, you know and then the address, or vice versa. 
depending on which one you want to look at as uh, the the first one. So, but you know, the other thing that's interesting is that on these two calls of the jumps, it actually adjusts for the fact that there is this extra uh, four bytes right here. So, I don't know why, but what I can tell you is that this is going to go on for quite some time. And I'm not going to sit here and jump through all of it. But what I will do is I'll scroll all the way down here. And we can get down to this point here. And um, right here, it ends up jumping six bytes ahead. So it ends up either wanting to land at 88 or 8A. And 88 is right there. And 8A is right there. So looking at the two possible code paths, I know that this instruction is the first one, or technically this one, but I'll just say this one. So these three right here are the three that are guaranteed to execute no matter which uh, entry path uh, it happens to enter into this sequence. So another, this is also a really good example of um, uh, this code. The way it's structured is, can be very tedious, and difficult to debug because you have to try and work your way back up to figure out, um, okay, which one of these interleaving paths is the CPU following and which one is it ignoring? So it's almost got two uh, interleaved um, uh, no-op sleds or no-op um, sequences um, stacked on top of each other. Uh, so I'm going to insert a breakpoint right here. And actually I can do run to selection, I guess. So I'll try that and see what happens. And there. So it ran, um, it ran to that selection. So, um, you know, I didn't go through this in detail, but you can see that pretty much what happened was it just followed the jumps all the way down. So none of this code above here actually has any effect on the rest of the system. Um, the other thing to point out is just these decoded two instructions, um, but these instructions aren't really intended to be executed. Um, and that might not be apparent, and that's something you have to follow when you're walking through it, and that's one of the techniques that they may use to try and, uh, to try and trick you. Uh, so finally I ended up right here. Uh, so then uh, what ends up doing is it's going to call these two, and then it's going to jump to A9, which is actually all the way down here. Um, and then what it's going to do is it's going to call AF, which is up here. So um, one of the reasons for this, and I'll show you why in a second, is that um, so this is going to jump all the way down here. But really what it wants to do is it just wants to continue linear, linearly. Um, one of the problems that your uh, processor runs into uh, when you do have an exploit uh, that successfully took over is that um, it's executing arbitrary code uh, that the application didn't set up memory to prepare for. Uh, so you run into the problem of um, the processor and I believe I talked about this during the x86 discussion, the processor doesn't have a way to uh, very easily, or I should say very intuitively, it's actually pretty easy how to get it, but it doesn't have a way to intuitively tell you what's my current address location. It doesn't have a way, like I don't have a way of just copying the contents of this register into any of these. So a trick that's actually very easy and straightforward uh, that they do is that they'll jump to a call instruction and that call instruction is just pointing back to the next line after that jump um, or any number of variation. There's uh, numerous different ways that you can do the same thing. Um, and the reason they do that is because when you call, uh, really what call ends up doing is it does two things. It takes the currently executing instruction, so it takes EIP, it makes a copy of EIP on the stack, so it moves a stack pointer up one or down one or whatever, depending on the direction flag. Um, and then 
it puts a copy of it on the top of the stack and then it jumps. So the difference between this jump and this call is that the call is going to save copy of the current, loca uh, current processor location, put it on the stack, and then it's going to jump. And so they take advantage of that by then pulling that memory location that was just added here. So this right here was just pushed on the stack by that call instruction down there. <clears throat> and um, what it does, I kind of overshadowed this, what it's actually doing is it's pushing the next instruction. So it's telling, uh, putting on the stack where the processor should go after it's done running a function. So what this does is it pretends there's a function that's going to be run. It puts the next instruction, so this one on the stack, and then it jumps here, and then this thing immediately takes it off the stack. So from the processor continuity perspective, from the time continuity perspective, um, when we get to this instruction, it's as if there was never a call. It's as if all it did was jump up here, and then jump down here, and then jump back up here. Um, <clears throat> but in ESI, and we'll see that in a second, you'll have a copy of the, or whoops, um, yeah. yeah, in ESI you'll have a copy of, uh, of the code, of the next instruction. <clears throat> so um, what's also interesting about what you're seeing right here is that this doesn't exactly look like executable code, this looks like ASCII data. And that's by design. So. Um, the way the attackers set this up is that this code right here is, I don't know, what is that like? Uh, so I can do the math, right? So AE to 8D. So maybe that's like 17 bytes, I think, or something, right? Yeah, maybe that's like, or not 17 bytes, but like a, 33 bytes. You know, that's 33 bytes of sequential executable data. What they did was they actually obfuscated all of this here. So none of this stuff here is actually executable code. What they did was they replaced it with this data that you're seeing here. And I'll show you what this looks like right here. So you have this right here, which ends up being, let's see, where does it go? Up to here, I think. Uh, yes. So this ends up being the block of executable code of legitimate instructions. And then after that is really a sequence of what looks to be ASCII data. So all of it is human readable ASCII characters. Um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this up and I'm going to actually have it over here so you can see what's going on. So keep an eye on the stuff where FTZQ blah 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 is. Um, and I'm kind of giving a hint here as to what's going on. Um, but this is an information hiding technique. So um, what's really common is that um, people write signatures to look inside of file types that aren't supposed to have executable code and try and find long sequences of binary executable code, so legitimate instructions, um, a sequence of instructions that disassembles into like um, machine code that would function. And so if you um, are making random data, chances are that you may only get like maybe three or four sequence of instructions before you get a broken instruction or some, something that's not executable. Um, <clears throat> if you happen to go through a large amount of document data, uh, like a PDF or something like that, and you happen to um, encounter um, a sequence of binary data that's really long, that seems like it actually is disassemblable instructions, so it's actually in instructions that are coherent, um, then it's very likely that you've run into a case of a exploit, or at least um, 
the binary code that an exploit would want to run. Um, so what they're trying to do is they're actually trying to conceal that. So what we can do, I'm gonna raise this thing up. So what it ends up doing is it pulls the first one in, which is this F, and then it compares it to 30, which is the uh, byte value for the character zero. So the byte value for the character zero is 30, the byte value for the character one is 31, etc. cetera. Um, and then if the two are equal, then it's gonna jump to 9AE, which as we recall, that happened to be the instruction down here that was the next instruction to run, or in other, you know, in other words, that happens to be the F right here in the, in the instruction sequence. So, and I'll show you like, let's see. Yeah, so if I'm going down here and looking and just trying to analyze this, this is the code going down here. Um, <clears throat> typically what you'll run into uh, is if I follow this down for a while, eventually I run into instructions that I would say don't make sense from a coherency command, so, or from a coherency standpoint. So in this case, um, it'd be very unlikely that you would decrement the ESP directly. You would more likely um, pop some value from the stack if you wanted to decrement it or increment it. Um, likewise, um, this ins instruction, which is to set, it's to uh, send stuff to an IO port or something, uh, this is actually a privileged instruction that you wouldn't run in Windows. So Acrobat wouldn't be running this instruction anyways. Uh, this would cause an exception. So when I'm saying I can go through here and I can analyze it, um, you're likely to run into system instructions or non-instructions after a very short period of analyzing data that's not executable code. So if I continue with this, what it does is it tests that to try and see if it's 30. And if this happens to be character 30, then it moves on to try and execute code down here where currently code doesn't exist. So I can ascertain from that, and I'm pointing at a, let me just go back up here, I'm pointing at what this test right here does, right, or really these two. Uh, so what I can ascertain from this is that whatever it's doing, it's gonna run through this list right here until it encounters character zero or byte value 30, which, I don't know if I can actually see it right here, but um, what I can do is I can watch the jump is not taken, and then it goes and it does, it runs a shift on whatever byte it did pull out, it increments the source index so it moves the cursor that's reading this thing forward one, then it moves data from there, so a byte from there into this register, it ands it with 0f, and then it adds the two together, and then it moves al onto bx, etc. So what it's doing is it ends up um, overwriting that data, so it saves the old location in ebx um, uh, with whatever happens to be there. So we'll see what happens. So it's shift left AL4. So what it's gonna do is just, uh, I'd say my best recommendation would be just to watch this right here. Um, so what it's gonna do is it's pulling a byte off. Yeah, it put F into here already. So it's gonna shift that left by four, which is actually going to move one of move the rightmost six over here, and then it's going to delete the other six. So then you end up with sixty. And then what it does is that it increments ESI again. Or no, it increments ESI. So it's going to get the next byte out of it. And then it's going to move that byte. So the next byte happens to be T, which I don't remember what the value is, but you'll see it in a second. It actually says it down here, 74. 
right here. So it's going to move 74 in there. So now you got 7460. And then it's going to end it with 0F so that you're going to keep the 4 and you're going to throw away the 7. And so you can see that just happened here. So now you end up with 4, 6. And then what it's going to do is it's going to put these. Let's see, what is it going to do? Oh, yeah, it's going to add the two of them together and it's going to store the result in AL. So it's going to add both of these together uh, and then put the result in AL. So 60 plus 4 is going to be 64. And that puts that in AL. And then it puts AL back into mem back into that original first memory location. So what it's doing is it's reading each one of these two ASCII bytes and it's taking the upper part of the first byte and the lower part of the second byte and it's combining those together and throwing away the remainder and then it's writing that back as a binary instruction. So what they did was they broke the binary code up into two halves each byte they broke it up into two halves and then they just mapped it to one of the ASCII characters so that when you run through this you see a bunch of ASCII data inside of a PDF when you're analyzing it and so that's what they ended up doing and then they wrote it back and now instead of having that F there you end up having a D which just happens to be the instruction what was it 64 so um, and then it's going to go back up here and we'll see they'll do it again and I'll just skip down here so you can see the next instruction is A1 now that it's writing and this stuff you can actually see changing in real time down here right so now that's 64 right here so then when it writes it again that ends up changing the instruction so what they're doing is they're actually changing the code that they want to execute in real time to live um, so that on disk, the code wasn't available, it's only available in memory. So I'm going to keep doing this. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single iteration of this again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let it run until this point. So where is that? Uh, Breakpoint. Run to selection. Hopefully this works. There we go. And you saw um, that it just it ran really fast and then it took another snapshot of memory and you can see all the instructions down here below that point that I had highlighted changed. And you can also see it happened right here. So, um, and it went all the way up until it got to this, there's actually a string data here, c colon backslash a dot exe, which happens to be one of the um, files that we wrote um, to disk, or that we saw was written to disk when we ran CaptureBat, or when we ran this in CaptureBat a while ago. So, I'm going <clears> to <throat> step forward, and then it has a unconditional jump to go all the way down to some other code down here somewhere. So 12F BF7, and it might be worth just taking note of this 9C3 right here, so 12F BF7, which is going to be all the way down here. I'm actually just scrolling down to it because I'm curious, and then that's going to call 9C3, which is back up here. So this is trying to do that exact same sequence of steps that I was showing you earlier, which is trying to get the current instruction pointer. This might actually indicate that the adversary managed to stitch two pieces of independent shellcode together to try and make a more uh, creative exploit, to try and evade some maybe detection that existed for just one or the other, but not both. So now we're back up here to the instruction just underneath the jump that we did. And EAX, um, or it doesn't have it yet, EAX actually has this data, but um, the top of the stack has this, or I should say has the memory location below there. Um, so we'll go back down here a second. Um, what was that, BFC? So BFC. Right 
here. So again, if I'm looking through this, um, this stuff ends up being things that I'll say are invalid instructions. One of the hints that I can get from the debugger that these are invalid instructions is you can see how many warning messages or error hints that there are on the right hand side over here. Um, I guarantee you that if I go in here, that code ends up being right around here. And you can see BFC. So here's BF4. So this is 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So, yeah, something like that, right? And so then this ends up being 633A. Um, this actually ends up being the string data, um, but then there's something, there's some other stuff after that. So basically, the end of the instruction sequence. Uh, I don't know exactly what it's going to do with that, but uh, we shall see. So then I'll walk through. Um, <clears throat> and so now what you can see, and this is uh, uh, also where it can be very handy, um, what you can see is that that string has been put into EAX, so a pointer to that string, uh, which is a file name, has been, pointed into e has been put into EAX, but also EBX is pointing to the D right here, so the beginning of that second instruction sequence. Um, now what it's doing is it is going to load some other data into these sequences of memory locations. So it's set up EDI to be pointing to um, the uh, system stack, I guess, and it is going to try and copy a number of values uh, into, into the stack before it calls this function, and it calls this function a bunch of times, and this is another function that's embedded in here. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go look at each one of these um, and follow them and see what this one does. So so right now I don't know exactly what this is doing, but I'm following it to try and see. So um, what you'll notice up here is that um, if you follow ECX up here, ECX has actually been replaced with something else and it's pointing to some string data. So I'm going to run through this a couple of times. It says activate ACTCTX. Um, so it looks like maybe a variable name or a symbol name. Uh, if I keep going through it, um, Eventually, yeah, eventually I end up looking at this. And so what it's going to do is it's going to go through each one of these things. Um, so this is one of the reasons I kept the Windows API open. So the Windows API ends up, I can search for these things. So add atom W or A, whichever one this happens to be A. Um, I'll say that any time that you see a what looks like a variable name or something like that that ends in capital A and capital W, especially if you see them in pairs like that. Um, in Windows, the, that's very indicative of uh, some common uh, Windows API um, functions that exist. And you can look up all these things here on Microsoft's website. And basically, uh, this is a function that's defined in one of the Windows libraries. Uh, so I can actually look and see that it's in the kernel library. And there's a Adam W as well as an Adam A uh, counterpart. So what's going on here is that it's got a list of all of the functions that are available in this library, and it's looking for a particular one. And the way it's looking for a particular one is it's stepping through the string like that. And instead of doing a direct string map or string match, 
it actually has a um, it actually has a function, or I should say, it has a number that um, uh, that it uses to. Um, that's basically a hash value. It's almost like a checksum or CRC32 or something like that. Um, that is actually comparing them against. So what it does is it runs that algorithm against the string, and then um, stores that value somewhere, and then uses this code sequence. And let's see what happens when it gets to the end of this function. Yep. And so then it uses like this stuff right here to determine if it found the right function or not. So I'm going to go basically to the end of this function. It's going to keep running, keep running. Um, it takes a little while, um, but eventually finishes. So here it's finished and you can see the function that it came up with was it found the global alloc. So Windows has the ability for you to be able to give a function name to Windows or get a list of all the function names in a library that's in memory and then request the function address from it. So um, because this code that's running in the exploit does not itself know or I should say, the application didn't set up the memory environment for this exploit code. This exploit code had to first figure out where in memory it's executing from because it didn't even know that. After that, in order for it to do anything useful in Windows, it needs to find the address pointers of a number of useful Windows functions that it wants to do things with. So one of those is to allocate more memory. Um, because the application didn't set up the environment for this, it didn't hook up any of those function pointers that it normally would have. This exploit code actually has to manually go through and do that. And that's what it's doing here is they built a little tiny function to go through and try and search uh, for uh, functions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a bunch of these and you'll see the functions pop up where this one is. So next to the E here, um, we should see that happen multiple times. So if I keep going here, then I have global free. So you have global alloc, global free. So the ability to allocate and free memory. Um, create file, which is the file, which is the function for opening a file in Windows or creating a file where one doesn't exist. Close handle, which is the function for closing a file or a pipe or anything else like that. Read file, you know, reading data from a file, write file, right? So it's finding it's running a search to get every single one of these functions and then what you'll see is it um, is it moves them so that's actually the line that's highlighted is it moves each one of these into a lookup table so you can see that this is always something that's 1d 2o 24 28 2c so they make sure that they're not going to overwrite one that they did so they're building a lookup table for each one of these things so they're building their own api lookup table so it's basically recreating a usable environment um, because the uh, compiler, when it built this application, didn't make that for the exploit. So copy file, etc. So we'll go through a few of these. And then finally, we have a delete file. So delete file A. And um, this is actually wanting to call the delete file function for some reason. Uh, so um, if I want to know what's it going, you know, what's going to happen if uh, we call delete file, I can actually, like, what are the arguments for delete file? I can actually look that up here. I'm not entirely certain how. So it says that there should be a file name. So there should be a pointer to a file name for delete file. So um, that would probably be this right here, 12fbfc. So 12fbfc, which is where that c colon a.exe is. So what it's trying to do is if there's an a.exe, it wants to delete a.exe. Um, so in their case, that might be, you know, so that if they try and create a.exe, it doesn't end up breaking their exploit, it's more likely to work. 
Uh, for instance, if they've tried to fish this person multiple times, they can clean up the previous exploit before they um, try and go for it with this one. And what ended up happening was it actually reported a not found error. So the delete went, you know, doesn't throw an exception when it doesn't find the file to delete. It just reports file not found. And then they ignore that error. So I'll keep going forward. And then we can see git file size. And uh, one of the interesting things about this is that um, git file size ends up basically taking a file handle, not a file name, if I remember correctly, as, uh, one, as the argument or one of the arguments. So take the file handle, which if you've ever used um, the open and close and stuff like that, uh, like in Python or in Java or anything, uh, you don't end up referencing the files directly. You open it, you get a file handle, and you can operate with that, right? Uh, so that's what they're doing here is uh, they're going to try and get the file size. Um, and you can see here the first argument is this handle. Uh, so I can actually click on here and I can look at all the file handles that are open uh, in, this, uh, in this environment, in this application. I'm going to stick this over to the side. Um, and we'll run a couple of iterations through this. So compare EAX to negative one. So if EAX is negative one, then you can see error invalid handle was what it returned. So it had error if that's negative one. So if there's an error, then go back up here and go back up to the top. So there, now I went back up to the top and it's incrementing it once. So it increments ESI, which is the handle number by one, and then it puts it in memory. So. I'll do this again. So now it's two. So then it pushes EAX and pushes ESI so that it can get the, this is argument two and this is argument one. And then it calls it again. So what really what it's doing is it's iterating through every single one of these handles and it's looking for one of them to be a file object. Uh, and I can find out what are file objects right here, right? Um, because file objects are going to be the only handles that have a file size associated with them. Directories won't, events won't, nothing else will have a file size associated with it, which is shown over here. Uh, so what it's trying to do is it's trying to find open files. It's not trying to open a file, it's trying to find an open file. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run execution until here. And then what we can see is that the file handle it found was OC. Or, yeah. So it found this directory. So I can continue doing that. Whoops. I can continue doing that, so I'll just do this. I have to do this again. Run to selection. And then the next one is OD. So it's basically iterating through each one of those. Um, and it's trying to determine if they have a file size that is um, greater than 4096. And if, if it's below that or equal to that, then it jumps back up here to the same spot. So we know that when it succeeds and it gets what it's looking for, maybe it gets down here. So I'm going to run execution until this point. So this is kind of what ends up happening as I step through trying to figure out what logic it's getting caught on and figure out where the next step is going to go. So then I can go, whoops, I have to do this. So then I can go here and I can see that it is looking at file handle 228, which I can look up here and I can even find out what file it's associated with. And in this case, it says that that is associated with this index.dat file, whatever the heck that is. So, so then I'll go through here. And uh, what it does is it does a global alloc. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what global alloc is going to do is we can actually look it up. Uh, 
um, that's going to allow you to allocate um, at least memory, or I should say at least some memory, and then give you an address. So it's almost like running free or malloc. So it returns a pointer uh, that's guaranteed to have at least the memory that's being asked for, which in this case, it won't. It's asking for like this much memory. Um, so uh, basically what it's going to try and do here, I'm going to skip because we're getting a little bit late on time. What it's trying to do here is it's going to run that sequence until finally it's looking at um, the PDF. So it's going to go through and it wants to map the PDF into memory because then it wants to try and get some other, I think it's the PDF, wants to try and get some other um, data out of the PDF. So set file pointer. So this is going to, uh, the arguments that they pass here, which is all zeros, is going to set the file pointer back to zero, make sure that it goes back to the beginning of the file um, before it tries to read the file into that memory space that it just allocated. So read file. And then once it's read the file into that memory space, uh, it ends up <clears throat> trying to search for this sequence of bytes. So um, yeah. Yeah. So then it ends up going back here if it fails. So, yeah. so um, basically, sorry, I'm just trying to map this one around in my head. Yeah, so then what it ends up wanting to do is it's looking for like these uh, series of bytes here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to skip these things because basically what it's trying to do is the attacker has stuck some breadcrumbs in the PDF. One of them is actually like f.zh and then there's another one as well. So there's about four different byte values which are embedded here that it made sure are inside of the PDF so that it can find them when it loads it into memory. So as it's trying to hunt for itself, um, the attacker stashed some breadcrumbs in there. So what it does is it opens each one of those files in sequence reads them into memory, tries to see if those byte values are in there. If they're not in there, then it goes to the next one, and it just keeps doing that repeating. But eventually it wants to get down here, where it's going to call one of those other functions that it put um, into memory earlier. So I'm going to skip to the chase here and run to this point. And now what you can see is that if I go here, it's going to call global free. Uh, I might have actually jumped the gun here. Hang on, 12A9A. This is the one I actually want to go to. So right here is where I want to go to now. Because that's the final test to basically um, free the memory and then return back up to the top and go to the next file. I'm going to go to here. And in here, we're going to go down the line here. And it's going to have put a whole bunch of values on the stack, including c colon a dot exe. And then it's going to create that file. So it's going to create that file. And then it's going to step down, set up the arguments for the next call, which is write the file. So it's going to write um, the data that uh, is basically the uh, the decrypted, um, actually this one's really interesting in that it ends up writing four bytes to disk here. So um, it stores that little, the first four bytes of the file are actually located somewhere else in memory so that any signatures looking for an exe embedded within a PDF won't find something that looks like an exe in here. So it stores the first four bytes of the exe somewhere else, um, writes those into the file, and that's what it's doing here is it's going to call write file. But then we'll see that DFD6E, that it's going to go and run this loop. And this loop is going to decode more data in some other location of memory. It's just going to keep running through that loop a whole bunch of times. We're again not going to follow it.
we'll let this go down here. And what we can see is that it wants to write file again, but this time it wants to write, uh, I think right here, a really large amount of data into that file. I think it's this one. Yeah. And we can go over here to write file. So here's this. So this argument here, the third argument, is going to be number of bytes to write. It's actually this one right here, so D04A, so a bunch of bytes. So it's going to write the file, then it's going to close the file, and then it's going to call winexec, so then it's going to execute the contents of the file um, so that it can go and do what it wants to do. So that then, when I run that piece of code, it then kicks off this new process that is running, that's opening that PDF and also opening up that a.exe and everything. So, and then you can see the uh, win exec, and then um, Adobe Acrobat closed finally. So the exception handler caught everything um, and then handed it over to the exploit code, and the exploit code just closed Acrobat Reader for us. Is the handle, handling the exception, but the last thing it did before it closed Acrobat Reader was it uh, used the win exec function, which you can see right here. To execute, which actually just takes a string command line to execute um, the a.exe file, which is one of the string that was sitting in memory that was given to it. And so if I want to, I can actually uh, see that a.exe is still here. So a.exe is there. So in a nutshell, that's uh, walking through the walking through that exploit code, except it working this time. And I thought that had a <coughs> this is really nice one that I found. I went through a different set of a uh, number of different sets of examples, and I found this one to be really useful because um, it employs almost every single one of the different techniques that I discussed in the slide that the attackers will use to try and regain control of the system and build out their uh, execution environment so that they can do more things. Uh, in, this, in this particular case, they just fetched an exe file that was encrypted inside of the PDF document, so they had a decryption loop built in um, that decrypted the data and then wrote it to a file. But if they wanted to, they could have um, requested to go out to the internet and download another file, and that's a complete other way that it works. All it requires is for them to search to hunt for the uh, proper libraries and proper functions in order to accomplish that.